Okay. All right. Thank you. Ed, would you like to give a uh, opening prayer? Our Father in heaven, we bow before thee this night, thanking thee for all the many blessings you bestowed upon us. We thank thee for that great love that you showed, that you gave your son, that through his sacrifice that we might have eternal life. We thank thee for your plan of salvation that has been revealed to us. And we pray as we study tonight that you'll open our hearts to heavenly wisdom, that we'll learn more what you have for mankind upon this earth. We ask thee to forgive us our sins and shortcomings. And when you send your son to this earth to establish that kingdom, we pray if it be your will that we might receive a portion that we will be able to reign with thee and to serve thee forevermore. And we ask these things to thy son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So tonight we're going to look at a couple different things. Um, one is it's sort of refresh ourselves and what's going on with Russia and Putin. I, I didn't even put the slide in, but he's been recently accused of poisoning another one of his um, well, competitors, and that has gone all over the world. And it's also, he's been charged in Germany, a lot of other places. So it's kind of a mess. Um, but Putin is one of these people who's an anomaly because he is such a private man. He doesn't want anybody to know what's going on in his life. I had the dogs, honey. Did you he hear did. me? I think he did let the dogs in. Anyway. <laughs> um, so Putin has a lot of power and, and he's an incredible figure, but I want to emphasize again, the only reason we're studying him is how it fits in with biblical prophecy to Israel. So if you haven't guessed all the things that he wants to do, um, these are a lot of the things that he wants from these different countries. Um, and he is looking to take them back. So for like, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, like the Ukraine, these states are inconsistently part of Europe's um, civilized, sophisticated, and incidental beautiful. Like Ukraine, they are NATO members, but the status is put, uh, <clears throat> still serves as a deterrent to Russia. Putin would love to digest them, but he's reluctant to violate a NATO border for now. But the coastline has the ports remaining active and his highly skilled workforce in Estonia may be the wired state of the planet. So what will Putin do? So basically I'm gonna sum up, in, in all these different cases, what he would like to do is take over the country again. Um, all these were the former Iron Curtain that he had before. When um, this happens, you know, it's all because he's trying to gobble up the, the lands that they once had and he, he feels like the worst event in history was what? The fall of communism in 1989. Um, he really does. He thinks it's all bad. So he wants Georgia back and Armenia, um, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and they all have minerals and different things like that. Poland has been part of Russia back and forth over its history. Ukraine, he's sending military dissidents in there to constantly destabilize the government. And that's the big takeaway is that Putin is constantly destabilizing the world. He's not looking to unite anybody. Um, he's looking to upset the thing in Europe. So right now he's working very, very hard to make all of Europe completely dependent on his oil as opposed to the Middle East. He's also um, going to do what to NATO? What is he trying to do to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? Anyone? Okay, he's trying to get rid of it. He wants to totally disband it because if he can get rid of NATO, then he can get rid of the United States in their missiles in the, in the Eastern Bloc countries and beyond and in Germany. So this is all that he's trying to accomplish. I wanna to show you too that Russia is ethnically extremely diverse. So you've got Russians, you've got Ukraine, Ukrainians, you've got Belosorians, you've got uh, all these different um, Uzbeks and Turks and other things who are all over the place. Um, 
they don't even speak the same language. So it really is a, a people of all different tongues living in this, in this different area. The yellow areas that you're seeing are virtually uninhabited. The red areas are the Russians. The hashed red areas are the Ukrainians. Um, the red dots are the Lasorians. Um, the, all the ones that are Turk peoples are in blue. And then Georgia and some of the other ones are in green. So you can see it's a very diverse population. Um, <clears throat> this is stuff that I had from 2015, but I think it's still very interesting because it's still going on. Ukraine, Putin declared, was in a state of civil war. And he added the Ukrainian army was, I can't even see, I'm going to have to minimize this. Oh. <clears throat> but he added that the Ukrainian army was a foreign NATO legion which doesn't pursue the national interests of Ukraine but wants to restrain Russia. The statement was carefully prepared by Russian television display of the mysterious English-speaking soldier in Ukraine uniform and footage of American military commanders in Kiev. After each of such visit by American military, the fighting in Ukraine starts anew. Um, the main program explained. This ratcheting up of anti-Western rhetoric is in part a response to the deteriorating economy. Since Mr. Putin upgraded the war in the Russia-NATO conflict, just as Standards & Poor's a rating, a rating agency was downgrading Russia's credit rating to junk. The fall of oil prices and the continuing pressure to, uh, on the trouble is driving up prices, causing much grumbling among ordinary Russians while the government is carefully avoiding the world crisis. It is the start of talks of anti-crisis measures. So in the opposition, Alexei Navani, uh, Russian opposition leader to Boris Nimstov, uh, veteran liberal, have called on the anti-crisis rally. Putin is crisis and war. No Putin, no crisis, and no war. So basically he's upsetting the situation again their credit is debunked. And right now, OPEC and Russia are at war over oil. Um, it's also interesting that it wasn't too many years ago that um, Vladimir Putin divorced his wife after almost 30 years of marriage. And he hasn't married since. He has two daughters. That's all they pretty much know. And there's almost no information about them. And the point is, is that he basically would like to set him up himself up as the new czar of Russia. He has actually made it easier for the ostracized and uh, demoted people who are Romanov descendants to come back to Russia and be naturalized citizens. So can I get a volunteer to read this one? Patsy, you want to do it? Okay. Russia prepares to restore Romanovs. Presidential Commission says it has evidence which will absolve Nicholas II of crimes and rehabilitate the last Tars Tars family. Nick Zara family. Thank you. Nick Patton Walsh in Mount Moscow. Russia may reclaim its Czar's history next year by declaring no the crimes of which its last monarch, Czar Nicholas II, was executed in 1917 at the height of the Bolshevik Revolution. Revolution. In keeping with the Kremlin's heartfelt nostalgic for the former monarchy, a presidential commission will in January ask Vladimir Putin to grant the request of one of Nicholas II's last surviving relatives to rehabilitate the Romanovs. Grand Duchess Leando Romanov, wife of Grand Duke Vladimir, the son of the last czar's cousin, was a, has appealed to the Presidential Commission on the Rehabilitation of Victims of Political Repression to declare null and void the crimes for which the Tsar monarchy was convicted and 
and executed by the Soviet committee 85 years ago. So it's just really interesting to me, and this is a recent article, that they're going to absolve Romanovs, which ruled for over 300 years and whose monarchs included Catherine the Great, Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, Nicholas Romanov II, and many, many others. Um, and they're doing all this so they can bring the monarchy back. And part of the thing is, is that Putin has restored all the palaces of the Romanovs and he uses them as state palaces whenever they have events. So he's seeing himself more and more in this role. And as you know, he's changed the entire constitution so that he can stay in power indefinitely. Um, so it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty unbelievable situation. Um, let's see, who haven't I called on? Um, let's see. Um, I can't see everybody who's online. I'm sorry, guys. Can I get a reader for this one? I'll take a whack at it if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Go ahead, Walter. Okay. A Russian view of monarchy. Russia under Nicholas II was all the survivals of feudalism that opposition political parties, independent trade unions and newspapers, a rather radical parliament and a modern legal system. Its agriculture was on the level of the USA with industry rapidly approaching the Western European level. In the USSR, there were total tyranny, no political liberties and practically no human rights. Its economy was not viable agriculture was destroyed. The terror against the population reached a scope unprecedented in history. No wonder many Russians took back, look back at the Tsarist Russia as a paradise lost. Yep, so it's, it's continuing to, even the people are looking to go back to a monarchy. And it should be known that like China, Russia is very insular and they do not want to have Western influence at all. So go ahead, Walter, and read the next part. It doesn't take a Machiavellian to see what's going on politically. Easing into the power-enhanced role of prime minister when his presidential term expires is but one way Putin could now extend his reign. It will be the culmination of what people who plan strategically against Russia have predicted for years. Vladimir Putin will be the saw of all the Russias for another decade and more. Only health appears likely to change the course upon which he now sails. Yep, so that's a recent article. Um, it's called Putin, the Tsar is more dangerous than ever. Um, it was published January 18th of 2020. So that was this year. Um, thank you for reading that, Walter. Um, who else can I get to read this one? Okay. How about Joanne? All right, Joanne. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself, Joanne? Joe's going to read it. Oh, great. Who's Joe? <laughs> yeah, you never introduced me or nothing. <laughs> I don't live here. <laughs> Rob Alamir, Putin, Romanov. Rarely does Putin pass up an opportunity to be photographed in a Kremlin, the heart of imperial splendor. 2012 has seen an acceleration of the process. In May, it was reported Putin has recreated the 1896 Kremlin gardens for his inauguration. Putin has consistently moved closer to the Orthodox Church. Many confiscated churches have been transferred back into Orthodox hands. Archimandrite, Tikhon Sovkanov, whatever, is even believed to be the spiritual advisor to the enigmatic leader. Enigmatic leader. In December, Putin expressed his desire to encourage the country to use Russia's history as a blueprint for how it should move forward. Putin even gave journalists souvenir Romanov memorabilia in gift bags to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the founding of the dynasty. Oh, they gave away some swag. <laughs> yes, he did. Surprising moves have been made by the Putin government's 
in early 2013. Fast track citizenship for Romanov descendants was announced recently, streamlining the long and difficult process. Regardless of the mo motivation for Putin wrapping himself in a Romanov mystique, Russia can only be truly great when it sees itself as it is, not how it was. Yeah, well, they disagree, but thank you for reading that. You did a great job. Uh, and it's it's been a continual process that he <clears throat> wanted to do this. So um, these are the actual descendants today. Um, so it just kind of gives you the, the whole dynasty all the way from Ivan the first the terrible to the descendants today we don't have time to get into all that but um, I just wanted to cover some other bits of history so in 1998 the remains of Nicholas and his wife Alexandra and their three daughters were reinterred at the Peter and Paul Cathedral in St. Petersburg beside their royal ancestors two years later the royal family was canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church as passion bearers <laughs> a classification similar to a martyr. The Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia recognized the family as martyrs. But the remains of Alex Alexei and Maria were discovered in 2007, have not yet been reinterred and are unlikely to be without the church's support. So <clears throat> this is leading up to what I think is we're already seeing in 2020 is that he is redone his whole constitution. These were older slides, but this is a newer slide that just came out. Um, who would like to read this one? Walter, you want to read again? Or somebody How else? about Karen? Can Karen read? Karen, go ahead. Yes, Karen can read. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm kind of playing his remote guy for you. <laughs> okay. How easily can Putin become the Tsar? In his uh, ornate countryside resort style after the Tarsus era, Russian noblemen's estate and decked with uh, portraits of royal royalty, royalty from centuries past. Olga Gerch Kustenstein Molaviziv, whatever, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> praised his fellow uh, monarchists. Marnicus for their role in, sh in shaping the country's biggest political overhaul in decades. Russia approved a constitutional changes to this week that could allow Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin the president, be uh, president to bypass terms limited and extend to his 20 year role, rule to at least uh, 2036 when he will be 83. Minimosti, a leading business newspaper, said the move essentially turns Putin into a monarch, a welcome scenario for the dozens of men, many sporting uh, extravagant facial, facial hair and traditional uh, customs, gathered in Mr. Molivar's uh, resort last, late last month. These words were like honey for our ears. Our call, the call of all traditionally minded people has been heard, said Mr. Malvi, who um, heeds the double-headed eagle, a pro-Putin monarchist society and is close to the Russian Orthodox Church. Radical as the changes are for this influential cliche of uh, Conservatives, they do not go far enough. They want the Russian president to become czar. The constitutional changes are leading us in the right direction towards constitutional monarchy. Uh, Mr. Mulvey, oh, who I'm saying it wrong, you know, added. Very good. So it's being recognized right now that everything he's been doing in the 90s and from 2000 to 2010 and over the last decade, he's been working on this for years. How to keep himself in power, how to find a way to basically resume the monarchy himself. And this is unheard of. The Russian Orthodox Church was plunged into utter obscurity by communism. It wasn't even allowed to function. Religion was dead, 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 dead. He has brought it back. He's given them their churches back, their land back. And 
why would you need to do this unless someday they're going to crown him emperor of, or czar of Russia? Um, radical as these changes are for the influential uh, clique of the conservatives, they do not go far enough. We are in this part, the consultation. The role played by many factions, such as Malafi's reflections, both of the growing influence of conservative voices and of Putin's desire to boost turnaround, uh, sorry, turnout of the people's vote on the 22nd of April to approve the constitutional changes, which he did get. The intentional proposals included funding for social spending and boosting demographics, such as incentives for voters, and to back arcane and poorly explained procedural changes, such as the elevating of the state council, a previously obscured body that Mr. Putin reported considering heading before publicly rejecting the idea that the, uh, has baffled the public. With most Russians broadly supportive of his 20 year role, only 25% planned to vote for the constitutional changes, while 64% admitted that they did not know what the reforms were even about. According to the poll conducted by independent uh, Levada Center in February. So I I'm just showing you this because the people don't even know what's going on. They didn't know really what was going on too well when the, <laughs> the monarchy was overthrown and they really haven't followed it very well because Putin is playing his cards very carefully and he's been doing this for 30 or more years. Um, and just to give you a point, there were, there were people in the 1950s who were doing a survey across Russia they didn't even know that there wasn't a monarchy anymore. That's how remote and lack of communication there is in Russia. Um, so it's still that kind of way today. It's very backwards. It's, there's not good communication at all. Um, the other thing to talk about is oil. So OPEC, which is all the oil nations that set the price for the barrel of oils, um, and Russia are doing battle as we speak. They've been doing it all year long. And they're, it's a game only one of them is going to win because they're basically selling oil for practically nothing. That's why our gas prices are so cheap. But this, <clears throat> this war will end and then the gas prices will go back to the roof. So um, right now, Russia is providing all of this to Europe and you're seeing a tremendous dependency on Europe um, to, for Russia's oils, and he, he's piping it right in there. So that's why he also wants Syria, because he can get a pipeline from Russia down to Syria that he can export very easily through the um, Persian Gulf and the Suez Canal to the Indian Ocean and the rest of the world. Um, so you can see this going on. And this is also from May of this year. So it says Moscow, for the most part, the past Soviet period, Energy officials in Russia have resisted op, sorry, OPEC um, entreaties to participate in the production costs to help prop up oil prices, arguing that was doing so was impossible because of the country's cold climate. They're just holding out because they want to be the, the bigger fish. Um, this week, confronted by the gusher of unsellable oil and no place to put it, Russia's energy executives unveiled plans to reduce production by a fifth by shutting down wells, many of them in the Arctic. Not eager to share the burden of the shutdowns with OPEC, the Russian government long maintained that curtailing production was not a simple matter for them as it was for the desert oil kingdoms. Supposedly, wells drilled in the permafrost could be shut down, lest they froze or could not be shut down because they might freeze requiring them to be drilled all over again, and they were, and then they would have to be reopened. Oil analysts have called the cold weather claim one of the global oil industry's big, biggest geopolitical bluffs, one of which Russian oil officials carried off with a straight face for decades to deflect OPEC demands to help with prices. So to put this in a nutshell, OPEC's like, you need to cooperate with us on oil prices, otherwise the prices are gonna remain extremely low. And Russia's like, we can't. Okay. We, have, uh, we have to keep our oil production going because our pipes will freeze and we'll have to redrill our, our wells. And they're the ones who are going into the Arctic, which is international and claiming this is theirs so they can continue to pump oil out of the Arctic. So 
the next phase I want to talk about is continuing with all the nations coming against Israel. And we're going to start with this one in Zechariah chapter 12. Um, this is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundations of the earth and who forms the spirit of man within him. I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. And we see that also in chapter 14. Uh, that, that is a little microcosm um, of chapter 14 fits within the second telescope. On that day, when all the nations of the earth shall be gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and his rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, and I will bind the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. On that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot and a wood pile like a flaming torch among the sheaves. So really quick, where do we get this image from in Genesis chapter 15 that's just like this, as well as when Moses told uh, Aaron to run between the people during a plague with fire to separate the people, and there was life on one side and death on the other. But what does Genesis 15 have to do with this? So that was the covenant that God made with Abraham when Abraham parted the animals and the torch and the flaming pot went between the pieces. And it was a covenant for all time. And we see this happening again, that Jerusalem is going to be this torch and this cup of trembling for all the other nations. Um, they will consume to the right and left all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first, so that the honor of the house of David and the Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem, so that the feeblest among them will be like David, and of the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. So very clear language from Zechariah 12, that these nations are going to come up against them and that God is not going to allow Jerusalem to be moved at all. So this is really the, the kicking off point and Zechariah 14 is as well, when half the city is besieged. From Psalms 59, it says, deliver me from my enemies, my God, protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the evildoers and save me from bloodthirsty men. See how they lie in wait for me. Fierce men conspire against me with no offense or sin of mine, O Lord. I have done no wrong, yet they are ready to attack me. Arise and help me. Look on my plight. O Lord, my God, God Almighty, the God of Israel, rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. And that's exactly what is about to happen. All these nations are about to be punished for their wickedness, but also for how they treated the Jews and that they had been a constant enemy and opponent of Israel as a nation. So Psalms 83, Joel 3, Isaiah 63, Obadiah 1, Zechariah chapters 12 and 14 all go together. They're really talking about the same event and it's the first initial war. There are several wars that happen after this and it's going to be like a pond a, a, a stone being dropped in a pond there are going to be concentric circles going out from jerusalem just like the message of the gospel was spread out all over the world starting from jerusalem and going out from there so psalm 83 is really powerful and it tells us what nations are involved so in the little blue section down here you can see what the nation was called and what it is today on the right hand side and it's also on the map um eb are you able to read this one it's too too small okay walter um did you say walter yes i did okay now that martha has also joined us oh martha can read that's fine <laughs> unless you want to read it walter and i'll get her to read the next one I'll read it. She can take the next. 
Okay. So who are the players in Psalm 83? Psalm 83, prayer against the enemies, a song. God, do not keep silent. Do not be deaf. God, do not be idle. See how your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have acted arrogantly. They devise clever schemes against your people. They conspire against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation so that Israel's name will no longer be remembered. For they have conspired with one mind. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and of the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon, Ahimelech, Philistia, and the inhabitants of Tyre. Even Assyria has joined them. They lend support to the sons of Lot. Bela, deal with them as you did with Midian, as you did with Sisera and Jabin at the Kishon River. They were destroyed in Endor. They became manure for the, for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb and all their tribal leaders like Zeba and Zamanur. Great. So in here, we know that the modern nations like Edom today is Palestinians and some of the area of Jordan. The Ishmaelites are the Saudis. Moab, the Palestinians, the Hagarines are um, in southern Jordan. Um, Gebal is part of Hezbollah and Lebanese. Ammon. Um, so it goes through all these different areas. Um, it gives us something to think about. But there's lots of interpretations on this, but it is the areas around Israel um, at the very least. So, are you going to talk about in verse 2 when it says, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult, or yours says, see how your enemies make an uproar? Yep. That word uproar or tumult is the word from Hamas. Really? I didn't know yep. that. Yeah. That's Hamas. awesome. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything more to say about um, Psalms 83? Well, I know that it was in the news last year or some. Okay. One of the years that was saying, look what it's saying, because this is what Iran is saying. Come, let us wipe them out as a nation so that Israel's name will no longer be remembered. And people got upset with that. So they said, okay, we won't <laughs> proclaim that. But it's like, how clear is that? They've already been prophesied they're going to think like that. And they've been saying it since 1948. In the Independence War of 48, that's exactly what they said. They said the same thing in 67 and 73. Yeah. so many other times they have they it's not enough to just conquer israel they have to kill everybody and destroy the whole country um and god is not going to allow that to happen so um but it basically says let their fate be like who um like the midianites when cicero was basically had a tent peg driven through his head by deborah um when they were destroyed at en Gedor and made like manure on the ground and Oreb and Zeb and all the tribal leaders. Uh, and so Midian basically is a, a mock-up for what's going to happen in this war. So you can see um, this is the area we're talking about, this inner circle that's going to come up as a confederation against um, Israel. Um, so it would be very interesting to see how this all plays out. And these are a lot of the Old Testament prophecies that all go together well. Obadiah 1, uh, Joel 3, Psalms 83, Ezekiel 35, Daniel, um, Genesis. But there's also some others, which is Isaiah 63. Um, that one I was surprised was not here and some others. So you can see there's 10 nations against Israel, um, 10 nations in Genesis 15. Um, ten Toes in Daniel chapter 2. Um, so there's lots of similarities um, between the different passages. Okay, so when we're talking about what's going to happen in Joel 3 and Isaiah 63, it mentions over and over again the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Why is this important? It comes from this place in Scripture, from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and it's all about what took place when uh, Jehoshaphat was the king. Um, Martha, you want to read this too? And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves. 
more than they could carry away. And there were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the valley of Baraka unto this day. Or the valley of Jehoshaphat. So it's really interesting. Um, and I would love to do even more study on the topography of it. I actually called Harold Lafferty tonight to make sure I wasn't telling you the wrong thing. But um, mm -hmm. Brother Thomas also thought it was the Kedron Valley and as it extends all the way down. So um, Martha, go ahead and continue here. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them, to go again to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries, when they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest round about. So Martha, translate this to Christ and his kingdom. How is this parallel? Well, that after the enemies are uh, um, subdued, then people are going to realize that it's God who's yep. been fighting with them, Indeed. for them. So this is where it all starts off. It's, it's sort of our, um, it's our, our stepping off point. I'm going to skip this section for now because I want to come back to it. Um, okay, let's go to Joel 3. Um, Linda Woolridge, can you read this one? She turned into a mute. How sad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your turn. Go. Okay. Joel 3, Judgment of the Nations. Yes, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and take them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there because of my people, my inheritance Israel. The nations have scattered the Israelites in foreign countries and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people. They bartered a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine to drink. Keep going. And also Tyre, Sidon, and all the territories of Philistia. What are you to me? Are you paying me back or trying to get even with me? I will quickly bring retribution on your heads. For you took my silver and gold and carried my finest treasures to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks to remove them far from their own territory. Look, I am about to rouse them up from the place where you sold them. I will bring retribution on your heads. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hands of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. Excellent. So this is the suggestive map of the path they might take um, between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount and, and considered the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And there's a lot of historical evidence for it. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I didn't switch this verse out, but you can see it here again um, where, where this is going on right, right um, from north to south. Uh, through the country. Um, <clears throat> so this is where it continues in verse 9. Um, Karen, can you read that? Sure. Joel 3, Judgment of the Nations. Uh, proclaim this among the nations. Prepare the holy war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the men of war advance and attack. Beat your plows to the, into the swords and your Putting knives into spears, that even the weaklings say, I am a warrior. Come quickly, all you surrounding nations, gather yourselves, bring down your warriors there. Lord, let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there 
I will set down the judge, all the surrounding, na surrounding nations. Swing this sickle because the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes because the wine press is full. The wine vats overflow because that's all. Oops, hang on a second. I can't see from my computer. Because of the wickedness of the nations is great. So like um, Second Chronicles chapter 20, God is sitting in judgment of these nations. There's going to be a, a total slaughter. That's why you have this imagery of a wine press, um, you know, that it's, it's being stomped on. Um, unfortunately, the only time I've ever seen it was I Love Lucy when she's <laughs> <laughs> stepping in the wine vat and getting juice all over the place. But it's just like that because the warriors are going to be those grapes that are going to be trampled. And he's going to sit in judgment. That's why in Isaiah 63, it says, who is this who comes with dyed garments from Basra? Um, because he's tread the wine press alone. So you have to look for the characteristics and we're seeing the same characteristics in each one of them. Um, Walter, can you read this one? Okay, let's see. Uh, Joel 3, multitudes in the valley decision. Judgments of the nations. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will cease their shining. The Lord will roar from Zion and raise his voice from Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will shake. The Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the Israelites. Okay, so what does this language sound like that Christ mentioned in the New Testament in Matthew and several other of the Gospels? When his disciples asked him when he would return in Matthew 24, what did he say? He has the same idea. He said the sun and moon and the darkened moon. and the stars would cease their shining. Mm -hmm. So it's much the same kind of thing because it's a, a great and dreadful day of the Lord. You also have an earthquake here. You have an earthquake in Zechariah 14, an earthquake mentioned in Matthew 24. So all of them include the same elements, um, that the sun and moon and stars being darkened, an earthquake, and judgment of the nations. That's all taking place together. Okay, let's see. Um, Betty or either one of you, can you read this or is it too small? It's pretty small. We got this little iPad. So You're going to have to use a monster screen so you can read one of these things. Well, right. we've got a computer upstairs, but if we go there, we can't talk. So I know. It's, we it's can't one of the other, right? So, I mean, it's either a little iPad or it's a big, big screen. I'll like read that. it, Joe, if you want. Okay, <laughs> Helen, you got the next one, okay? Okay. All right, go ahead. Joel 3, judgment of the nations, Israel blessed. Then you will know that I am Yahweh, your God, who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy and foreigners will never overrun it. In that day, the, mount the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the streams of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will issue from the Lord's house, watering the valley, valley of the Achates. Egypt will become desolate, and Edom a desert wasteland because of the violence done to the people of Judah, in, the, in whose land they shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. I will pardon their blood guilt, which I have not pardoned, for the Lord dwells in Zion. So after this apocalyptic kind of disaster of war, then Jerusalem is going to be restored, and it's going to be that land flowing with milk and honey again, and Egypt's going to be a desolation. Zachariah. So I want you to look at this map, because I think it's pretty helpful. Um, I think so. I'm sorry? All right, this is a very old map. So you have the Valley of Hinnom down here, and then you have the Valley of Kidron, or the Valley of Jehoshaphat on the east side. And here's the Mount of Olives over here. So this is where they're saying 
they might march up. Well, of course, when I talked to Harold Lafferty, it's like, that's impossible. It's only 200 feet wide and <laughs> several hundred feet deep. But um, I don't know how it will happen. We'll have to see. Or if there's another Valley of Jehoshaphat that would be more pertinent. So I will go on to the next slide. Now, this is Isaiah 63. So just remember, you've got Joel 3, Isaiah 63, Psalm 83, um, Obadiah 1, and a couple other passages of Zechariah 12 and 14 that all fit on the same event. And the reason we know this is only because the elements are the same. And it's not the same as Armageddon. As a matter of fact, it is not Armageddon at all. So, um, Helen, can you read Isaiah 63? The Lord's Day of Vengeance. Who is this coming from Edom in crimson, stained garments from Basra? This one who is splendid in his apparel, rising up proudly in great might. It is I proclaiming vindication, powerful to save. Why are your clothes red and your garments like one who treads in a wine press? I trample the wine press alone and no one from the nations was with me. I trampled them on, in my anger and ground them under my foot, un, them underfoot in my fury. Their blood spattered my garments and all my clothes are stained. For I planned the day of vengeance and the year of my redemption came. I looked, but there was no one to help. And I was amazed that no one assisted. So my arm accomplished victory for me and my wrath assisted me. I crushed the nations in my anger. I made them drunk with my wrath and poured out their blood on the ground. So give me the similarities that you have noticed so far between Psalms 83, Joel 3, and Isaiah 63. What are the elements that are the same? Garment stained yep. with red, with blood. You've got the, this judgment with the trampling of the grapes. Yeah, yeah they're the trampled. Grapes. Yep, they're trampled. What else? No one assisted. Exactly. That's another key element. No one assisted in any of the three events. Um, what else? The Lord was angered. Yes, and he was there for vindication of his people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you get that as the purpose in all three places. It's just like, I am going to judge all these nations for what they've done to my people, Israel. And, and in each and of the places, of the we get an indictment of why they're being punished, why they're being judged. So, was Basra in, in, in the other verse, uh, places in scripture? No, is, it is not. No. What was the word? Basra. Um, okay, no. And I haven't even looked that up, so <laughs> I should have done that as homework, but that's a good question for next week, so I'll try to get a solution for you. I looked it up once, and it said, Boz, a place that's known for dyed garments. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But that's not right. No, <laughs> it's only used like this here. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. So I just want you to see the common elements and why they go together, because people will try to pair this up with scripture that doesn't match. So oftentimes they'll try to link this up with Ezekiel 38 and 39, and it does not fit. It's not the same audience, it's not the same place, and none of the reasons are the same. So we have to be very good at discernment as Bible students to be able to say, these are the comparisons. So next week I hope to have a actual table for you to compare the elements so we can say, okay, these fit together and these don't, um, because they're very important. Um, let's see. Yeah, we're gonna stop there for tonight and I will pick up next week. Um, so I appreciate you all um, coming tonight and I'll go ahead and conclude with prayer real quick. Uh, one point, Joseph? Yes, Walter. Um, Basra actually means um, sheepfold or enclosure. Okay. In Hebrew, anyway. If that's helpful to you. It is. Well, I'm going to do my homework on that and I'm doing okay. the comparison of the table. Actually, Walter, can you finish up with a prayer? I'll be glad to. Thanks.
Dear kind and merciful Heavenly Father, we thank thee for so many of the blessings that you give to us, that you show your love to us in so many ways, that you guide, direct us in each and every way and through our days who we but ask. So quick to forgive and so slow at the wrap that you could have against us. We're thankful that you are in our daily lives for the many blessings of life that you give to us. You give us food and clothes and shelter, yet you also care for those around about us even those who search for your word. We thank thee for the many things you do in our lives and pray that we will be prepared for that day, that we long for the return of thy son and establish of thy kingdom here upon the face of this earth. And especially look for the time when thy will shall be done on, done on earth, even as it is in heaven. For in that day shall all the chaos and all the strangeness of the kingdom of men shall be put away. We pray for the day that you truly are blessed, and that we may give our prayers to you in obedience, and do those things which are right in your sight. We pray for the day of transformation and all these things shall be said and that you may make us a part of it that our new bodies will be likened unto thy son, free from sin and desire for sin, that our heart and mind will be solely yours. We pray for those who are not as blessed as we are this night to come together, be it those who have challenges and difficulties in their life. As we look around us and see thy hand at work, the sun, the moon, the stars, the very earth around us, we know you're at work. We thank thee for all things. In the name of thy son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you guys for attending. I really appreciate it. And was there anything anybody else wanted to share? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that one of the things uh, to be noted is that Jehoshaphat was such a good king from the very beginning, mm -hmm. but he reigned to the end of his reign. And that um, with all that he had to put up with his previous family, that was, um, you know, pretty destructive and um, evil. Um, I think that's why God blessed him so much. Uh, well, I don't think, I know that's why God blessed him with so much and made several covenants with him. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's it's an incredible story and it all really goes together and we just have to look mm -hmm. for all the right elements to be there. So next week I'll try to look up more on Basra and also give you a comparison table between all the different passages we've looked at. So you have some real hard evidence that these all go together and that it's distinct and different from Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it, it just bothers me that brothers throw these things together and the elements are not the same. We have to show discernment over separating these things out so that they make sense. Um, anyway, so thank you all for attending. Any other news anybody wants to share? All right. Well, y'all have a good night. Enjoy the beach, Woolridges. Thanks for helping yeah. put this together. Take care, Karen. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Mm. Take care. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you. you too. Bye. 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 It doesn't end till I end till I end though. <laughs> that was for so I thought about here at the end. It didn't go matter. <laughs> good night. Good night. All right, guys, I'm ending it all in the meeting for y'all. Take care now. Bye. Good night. Good night.